Unfiltered, the official Sunderland AFC podcast. Welcome along, everyone, to SAFC Unfiltered. Myself and Danny are back once again. It's been another... Well, uh, you can't call Southern Football Club boring, can you, Danny? No, certainly not. Um, yeah, came out of the blue, really, didn't it? I think um, in the middle of the transfer window, certainly coming towards the end of it. And, uh, yeah, chance to go top of the table. And, and it went wrong, didn't it, at the weekend? So, unfortunately for Lee Johnson, um, he's lost his job and we're in the search for a new manager. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure a lot of fans, like ourselves, are wanting answers to a lot of questions. Of course, we want to know all about those new players as well as finding out why some of the, the existing players chose to leave the club and what proved to be quite a busy transfer window for Sunderland. Well, it was, yeah. Certainly a few ins and outs, wasn't there? Um, Christian Speakman and the, and the team behind the scenes have been busy over the last couple of weeks. And uh, yeah, as you say, right until uh, till the death there at the end of the transfer window closing. So uh, interesting to see how we go now. I think we did need some uh, some fresh blood into the team um, to help the lads out who have done great so far this season. And as you say, we're coming towards the end of that. You know, the running now, isn't it? 17 games to go. And we've got to keep on going, keep fighting. Um, top two places slipping away slightly this moment in time. But as I say, still a lot of football to be played. Yeah, and we're finally allowed back up to the Academy of Light. It's going to be good to see, you know, what's going on up there. It's nice. You get a better feel for these podcasts, don't you, when you do them in the belly of the beast, as it were. Yeah, it is. Yeah, over Zoom, it's it's not ideal, is it? But obviously, you know, with COVID coming and going, um, it's it's stopped us getting down the training ground. But no, it's good to get down there today, um, get in amongst it, as you say, and, uh, and have a good chat with Christian and see what he's got to say. OK, then, let's do it. Welcome to SAFC Unfiltered Sporting Director Christian Speakman. How are you doing, Christian? Really good, thanks, guys. Good afternoon to you both. Have you had any sleep over the last couple of days? Uh, last couple of weeks, no. Unfortunately, sleep is something that's been in short supply of, but um, look, it's part of the job. It's an intense period of time, and obviously we've got to do our best for everyone involved with the club and the supporters to obviously make sure that the team's in the best, best place possible. So... Um, yeah, it's also an exciting time, isn't it? Because, you know, we've got lots of different things going on, so uh, we're all good. Well, this podcast was scheduled about a week ago. Uh, thanks for, you know, com- still doing it because so much has happened in, in the last week. I guess we, you, you know, if, if you're for not skirt around any, any issues, but on Saturday, someone on the other end of possibly one of their worst results in history, were beaten 6 0 by Bolton Wanderers. Since then, the first team coach, Lee Johnson, has been relieved of his duties. Was that result uh, the reason why Lee is not at the club anymore? No, I don't, I don't think we want to be looking at these types of decisions around singular results, although you're quite right to obviously state the sort of significance of it. Um, just with regard to obviously the podcast piece, you know, I did intimate, I think, in previous ones we've done that. You know, we want to be um, discussing the matters in hand at the relevant times. It's all very well and good when they're really positive, you know, conversations, if you like, and topics. There's obviously things that are going to be uh, maybe more controversial that we need to discuss. So we don't want to skirt around them. And I always want to sort of front up the discussion around where we are, why it's happening, and, and give fans an insight into obviously what's going on with their football club. Yeah, so we appreciate that, and I'm sure the fans will appreciate that as as well, Christian. So, so Lee was relieved of his duties. I guess that came from the top. Yeah, we've, we're constantly reviewing and evaluating all parts of the business and obviously the first team's a real focus for us. Um, we want the team to be in a position to get promoted at the end of the season. Um, we want to see results with some consistency and and obviously when you get to a, a 6-0 away defeat as we did in the manner the defeat is, obviously that's a... It's an, an additional topic on top of some of the other topics that are discussed at executive level, board level and ownership level. Um, and I think the, it's the underlying inconsistency and um, it's probably the alignment to our philosophy, the way we want to play, which has probably caused most concern. Um, we're in a really, really good position for promotion. And based on that, um, the decision was taken to obviously make a change to try to ensure that we can try to populate that top two and put ourselves in the best place getting up. I guess it's fine margins, Christian, as well, isn't it? Because you, you pull up at Bolton at the weekend there at three o'clock, uh, opportunity to go top of the table. Um, and then 90 minutes later, as you say there, we're on a, mm. the back of a, a bit of a hiding. Um, and then we drop down to third, I think. And then I guess you've seen that little gap starting to open up as well. You know, the two teams above us, Wigan and Rotherham, games in hand. Um, 
is it a case as well of and maybe thinking we need to act fast while well, we've got 17 games to come um, still a lot of games to play obviously but just maybe freshening it up new ideas coming into the place and obviously a new manager to, to come in and do that I guess yeah no, it's, it's, it's a really really competitive environment in the top end of that League One and obviously you've got a couple of teams maybe pulling away a little bit based on the results you've got some teams behind us competing and doing really really well I think the points gap definitely narrowed up across yeah. that top eight um, and like I said you know if we continue to if we continue to gain the inconsistency in the results and more so the inconsistency in the performances, we're not going to meet that short term aim of getting promoted, or we're going to risk some danger around that even with the playoff scenario based on that trend of results. Um, but we're also then not moving that strategy forward in terms of that game style that we want to see being played, um, that we've been really explicit about from the start. And these are all conversations that we've had internal with Lee and the guys previously. Um, and it gets to a point where you know decisions have to be made, a decision not to do anything, yeah. a decision to do something, and that's not something that you you know coming away from a game and going right, this is what's happening. That's a series of really really in depth meetings at executive level, board level, and an ownership level, because you're talking about really really significant parts of the football club and making sure that um, we you know you're making the best possible decision and trying to mitigate as much risk as possible. Um, they're never easy decisions because you're, you're always discussing it about people that you're working for with, um, that you enjoy their company, that you know from a person perspective they're trying everything they possibly can. They've moved away from home to be around the football club and to be giving everything to the job. And I think it's only fair on any member of staff that's in that type of scenario that you're giving the you know the full care and attention to making the right decision. Uh, and just want to ask you about the the model which you've you've implemented successfully throughout the football club. You know, all the way through the youth teams into the ladies, and you know, as a structure of the football club as well in the business side as well. There's a whole new structure there. Are you constantly looking at possibilities then, as you are players? You know, possible left backs who could come in the club. You've been tracking players, I'm sure, for the whole period of time you've been in your position. Position. Is it the same with a first team coach position? Yeah, very much so. I mean, we had a, a really, really clear criteria on the type of coach that we want to work for the club, um, what the requirements are of that individual, what we're judging them against, because I think that's really, really clear. You need to have clarity on that for any member of staff. And uh, naturally, we're running a succession plan for that position. So we've been tracking coaches, you know, for over the last year. That's not because of anything underhand. Mm -hmm. That'd be, you know, any top business would be having a plan on who's their next chief exec, who's next, next head of sales, who's going to come through. And obviously we have internal uh, members of staff. Uh, it's a big bridge to jump in terms of moving on to being obviously a head coach, certainly for a club the size of Sunderland. Um, but obviously we're also looking out there who matches up with our style of play, who's progressing, um, who do we think can be somebody who could come in and add value to our to our uh, football club so that's constantly underway the natural change that you get is obviously when the position becomes vacant mm -hmm. other members of the football community pop up and, and there's other p people to consider that you might not have considered because you weren't sure whether they're available etc so you're just trying to at the minute merge those two processes together um, and obviously try to ensure that we run the right process which we've, again we've been really clear internally about how we're going to do that to come out with the best decision. Yeah, and I think um, you know, looking from the outside for, for fans, they'll be looking at the names that are getting linked with the job. Um, you've got different types of characters on there, haven't you? You've got your perhaps your tried and trusted uh, old school managers, um, and then your, your young up and coming managers as well. Um, I, I guess that's an important factor which comes into play with the style of play we've gone for this season, isn't it? And the, the way you're trying to play. Um, you know, some people might think, do we go for the tried and trusted to try and get us over the line? You know, certainly secure a playoff place, and then you know you've got a safe pair of hands who've been there and done it type of thing. Or do we go with somebody you know who can come straight in with the squad that's been put together? You know, even the recruits which have come in in the recent weeks, uh, and which is suited to go with these younger players. Yeah, I think we want to be uh, really, really detailed and thorough in our sort of investigating the individuals because I think like naturally we we uh, exist in a very uh, media uh, focused environment and you know and we get very generic terms of reference in terms of old school manager young and up and coming that then there's natural conversations everyone have we're just trying to go a couple of layers below that what what, what exactly 
uh, what impact does that person have? Yeah. You know, what style of play do they have? You know, because sometimes, you know, you can get a lot of confirmation bias in that. We also got a data analytics team that we want them to be able to uh, robustly challenge the process and the concept, you know, the, make sure we've got no misconceptions around what's, what's actually on the page that we want to pick from those people. And, um, you know, also the human piece as well in terms of the connection with what's going on here and how we're working and um, them understanding Sunderland. It's not just a head coach's job yeah. at a football club. It's head coach's job at Sunderland. And that's a really, really like defined thing that we're looking for. There's so much to get through, Christian. I just want to pull one more final point yeah. on the first team coach position. Um, I just want to know for the fans who's involved in the process. And I guess the process is well underway at the moment. Yeah, yeah, the process is well underway. Um, like you said, we have had a little bit of a delay because of the last 24 hours of the transfer window. Um, but that was really, really important because from an integrity perspective and what we are as a football club, what we didn't want to do was to uh, pursue a search process when we still had a person in situ. I think that's just disrespectful to the person. Um, and we want to make sure that obviously those conversations are had and then we can get on with the, the fresh direction. Um, so we're well underway with that. That's a search which is led by myself, in conjunction with our executive team, so Steve Davison and Kirill. Um, we have members of the board that are assisting with that. And then on top of that, we've got our football management team here at the AOL, who are also integrated with that because the head coach has to work as part of that team. And therefore, you know, we have to ensure that the connection and, and the uh, relationships between those people are going to be you know, effective. Otherwise, you're just creating a problem that's going to be further down the track. OK, right. We'll leave that there then. Uh, hopefully the fans have got some answers from what you've said to us this afternoon. So thanks for that. Um, we've had a busy ins and outs window. You know, arguably, you know, January is harder uh, transfer window than the summer because of complexities of other clubs and situations. And probably COVID as well still having an effect. Are we completely done, though? Are we likely to bring in any more free agents or anything like that, do you think? Um, as I said last time, as soon as the transfer window finishes, you know, you're in the pursuit of always trying to improve the group, the squad, um, and we, we'll always look at that free agency market because you always want to make sure that there's nothing that you know you might have missed or something that can add some additional value. So we're doing that now. We always have a sort of three, four day period where, where we run that. Um, ultimately, we were, we're super pleased with where we got to at the end of January. It's probably one of the most difficult Januarys I've experienced in recent years, especially with the with the issues around COVID, squads squads obviously needing to be maintained at different, you know, championship and Premier League level because of obviously the rules and regulations about fulfilling fixtures. I think everyone's recognised that just put a huge delay on it. We were really pleased that we were able to get a lot of our business done early and we weren't certainly doing too much in the sort of final 72 hours. Um, although obviously we did have some incomings in that period, but a lot of that was stuff that we were tying up that had been running for a couple of weeks. Naturally, that tends to happen at times. Um, but like, you know, if you look at the types of players that we brought in and how they complement both the strategy and the functionality of the team, you know, within this league, like, you know, really, really pleased with those players. And before we go to Danny's internet, you know, poll, which he did, which is the height of, you know... So, oh, is there an so internet poll? Sure. Yeah, well. you know, he's been doing some real research in, in the fields, right? Are you happy with how the window's gone? Yeah, no, we're, look, we're really happy with the window. Um, like, it's a... It's, uh, it's a constantly evolving piece of work and it's not obviously finite and, and you know, you move to the next window. So you're constantly striving to improve. So I don't think anyone wants to say, that's it, we're done. You're constantly looking to continue to improve. And we're really, really happy about where we are leaving January and heading through the rest of the season into the summer. OK, Danny, what was the results of your scientific research? Yeah, 92% came back as happy with the business that's been done. Um, Perfect. Yeah, I mean... I, I My mum did spend a, a whole day pressing the button on that get, poll, yeah. to be fair to her. Yes, so, yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad to see that's made some impact. Yeah, uh, I, I have noticed that one or two comments. I mean, obviously, fans looking at the ins and outs, really. Um, obviously, Tom Flanagan going to Shrewsbury on deadline day as well. Um, you know, at the back, Denver Hume going to Portsmouth. Yeah. Ollie Younger, Doncaster, Alves going back to West Ham. So there's a, at the back, we lost a few numbers, but you've recruited Trey Hume's come in. Yeah. And, and Danny Barth, obviously. Um, I think fans may have a little concern that the department where, you know, if you look at the top end of the pitch, we're quite well stacked. Maybe one or two numbers short, perhaps with injuries, maybe. Um, obviously, Huggins is out for, for a month or two, I think, still, isn't he? So maybe looking at still recruiting. Um, defensively, a little bit, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, in terms of in terms of numbers wise, I think I know. I think it's been referenced like at centre back. You know, we had four, we still got four. Um, everyone will cast an assumption. Uh, but he's not far off coming back as well. View. Yeah, no, yeah. he's like you know, week ten days away. 
everyone will have a judgment on the value and the quality of those four. Yeah. Naturally, that's obviously you know out there for supporters to make a judgment on. But I'm really super comfortable with that. Um, we've got four in Bath, um, Wright, Doyle, and Arby. Yeah. Um, you know, I think if we if you said to me, you know, what would you have done? What could you have done? I think naturally we would have uh, liked to have acquired another centre back. We tried really, really hard to do that, in both in terms of significant bids on permanent players right. um, and loan players. But you've also got to draw a line under how far you're going to go before you, you, you're doing something that's negatively going to impact what we're trying to do. Um, and I think from that perspective, we were really comfortable where we got to. Um, you know, you can bring players in, they can be successful. You can, you can choose not to bring a certain player in because you don't think they're going to fit. You know, the guys, myself and the recruitment department tried really, really hard to try to identify and find another one. Um, but it wasn't to be. You know, that, that yeah. player didn't exist in the end within obviously what we wanted the scope of that player to be. And obviously on deadline day, there were one or two that did come in. Yeah. Um, Jay Matete, what can you tell us about him coming in from Fleetwood? Uh, I, think, I mean, Jay's completely aligned to obviously our philosophy and strategy in terms of trying to find and, and acquire young talent that's got the ability to obviously grow with the club. Uh, potentially got future value. Uh, he's a dynamic, versatile midfield player. He's got loads and loads of energy. He's got a real vibrant personality. He can carry, retain and keep the ball. He can play forward. He's an aggressive um, player in that middle third. Um, I think he's something that someone's going to really, really compliment the team, the existing players that's in the team and, and you know, also be able to be part of that longer term view you know, without necessarily... Uh, it's not a negative on the short term because you've got someone who's a League One player who's playing at this level, yeah. understands exactly what's going on and can come and hit the ground running. As you've alluded to before, 17 games to go, he can have a massive impact on, on our season. There's a lot of football in minds as well, saying that the Jim Matete deal is, you know, arguably the, the signing of the window for Sunderland because a lot of clubs were looking at him. Is that true? Yeah, I, I said to the guys this morning, I felt for Jay a little bit because he ended up getting the deal done on deadline day and it got quite late towards the end for no real sinister reason at all, to be fair. And obviously we had another signing that night. Did we? Um, we'll, come on, so. we'll come on to that, don't yeah, worry. Uh, we had another signing that night as well. So it didn't overshadow Jay, I think, but obviously just took a little bit of the spotlight off it. Um, you know, Jay, Jay was someone who was well covered from the Championship and the Premier League. And I think that's where, at the minute, that's the value and the power of Sunderland, which is that we're tracking and monitoring these players and we're ready to go. You've got ownership that are happy to spend the money. You're talking significant values. I think if you looked at our transfer fees it, uh, we spent um, on those players in his window, I don't think anyone would have spent more money than us on those players, certainly in terms of transfer values and certainly transfer values and when you start looking at transfer values and salaries. So it's a huge investment. And the rest of the market, unfortunately, wasn't able to move on some players. So I know, for example, there's lots of teams, because we spoke to them since, like, you know, really disappointed we couldn't get him, but we yeah. couldn't move because of this financial reason or this or that. And then obviously we were able to go and get that deal done really, really quickly in the end and, and acquire the player. And that's where I think that's going to be a huge, huge bonus for us moving forward that we're able to operate quickly and efficiently like that. Um, he, look, he'll, be a, he'll be a huge success for us, I have no doubt about that. He's a great kid. He's absolutely buzzing to be at Sunderland. And naturally, I think that everyone on this, listening to this podcast would obviously be delighted to hear that. I think it looks like you're backing him as well, the length of the contract you've given him as well coming in. Um, you know, 20 year old, as you say, he's fit and ready, been playing, hasn't he, this year? So, yeah, straight in at the weekend. Um, you've also recruited Patrick Roberts from Manchester City and uh, Jack Clark coming in on loan from Spurs. We saw a little bit of them against Bolton. They look like they like getting on the ball. Yeah, again, completely aligned to our playing philosophy. Um, got some real tactical flexibility. You know, Jack can play. He can play in either of the two tens positions. He can play wide and he can also play nine, which was the attracting thing for Jack. Can take the ball to feet, can run in behind and can be really, really expansive in that as well. I think a lot of fans won't have seen him play a lot of nine because he tended to play that in some behind closed doors games and some 23s fixtures. But that's the depth of our recruitment. We're looking right down to try to find the little nuances that we can maybe get a competitive advantage on. Um, so he can play those positions. Look, Patrick's... Um, Patrick's probably a well-known player amongst the fans in terms of his profile, where he's played, where he's come from. You know, he's obviously not had a great period in the last six months in terms of his journey, where he's at. He's here. He's thrilled to be at Sunderland. He's exactly what Sunderland fan I feel would want to come and watch on a Saturday because he's explosive, yeah. he's exciting, um, and we've got loads of opportunity in the top third of the pitch to play different shapes and play, you know, um, 
with the opportunity to change players within the games and change players from games to games to stay to keep that real high tempo play. Just with, with Patrick and, and Jack, looking at them both, um, both at a young age, sort of burst onto the scene, as they say, didn't they, really? Jack, as you say, at Leeds, I remember watching a game on, on Sky one night when he came on and I think he scored and he was electric. Um, I'll say they lost their way. He's obviously had a big move to Spurs, hasn't he? Hasn't obviously forced his way into the first team there, been playing 23. He's had a couple of loans in the last mm. season or two. Big opportunity for these two almost to, to kickstart themselves again and get going, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Like, everyone's journey is different and... Um... You know, as much as I suppose they would want and everyone would want that sort of linear progression, um, you know, you run into these problems. It's how you deal with those setbacks, isn't it? It's what you yeah. do about it. Um, I, I see, without generalising them both together, two, two young lads love their football, love getting on the ball, love playing in front of that crowd. You know, I think, again, a big pull for here is coming to Sunderland and playing in front of that 30 plus thousand fans because that's the type of individuals they are. They're, they're, they, they want that environment. They want that Feed off the crowd, yeah. yeah. They want that and they want to entertain. You know, that's where they're at. Um, you know, I think you've seen with someone like Pritch, where maybe at the start people are questioning, well, why have we signed Pritch? Once you see him in yeah, the environment and get him up to speed, then you start to see the quality in that type of individual. And I see a very similar thing with these two. Yeah. Um, you know, they've got work to do, you know, because naturally that's where they are. But what a great platform for those to be able to come in here and, and show everyone, you know, what they've got. And like I said, uh, it's a win-win situation, isn't it? If they can play, perform and do well, yeah. well, naturally we're going to be reaping the benefits. And at the back as well, we brought in Trey Hume as well, who we haven't seen yet in the in the first team. He's been on the bench, hasn't he? And uh, Danny Bartz came straight into the side. He had a really good first game. Scored a decent diving header in the second game, but, you know, was in the wrong net. But... Is he the experience he he what we needed? At the, that, yeah. bless him. But is he the experience you, we needed at the back? And um, it's at the back where it's, that's where the issues are, isn't it, at the moment? Yeah, I mean, look, our our goals against our xG against all that type of stuff. You look at you can't you can't move away from that and go it's not doesn't exist. You know, it's quite clear to see, um, and you want to try and make some improvements. With it. I think it's really really unfair to say it's a problem that's at the back. Yeah. It's a team game. Yeah. How we defend from the front. How we get that pressure on? When and where we get that pressure on? Where do we where do we put that defensive structure? You know, is it a high low press? Um, is really really important to that. Trey's come in from Linfield from a slightly different uh, model in terms of the training program. So we're trying to get him up to speed as quick as possible. But again, bags of load long term potential straight in with the first team squad every day in training. Danny's obviously slightly different. Um, we felt that we wanted some greater leadership on the pitch, some presence. Obviously the the general game style in League One can be it can be very indifferent at times, but obviously there is a lot of direct play there, and that may be where we've maybe suffered a little bit. I think that'd probably be fair to say. And I think Danny showed certainly in the in the Portsmouth game, yeah, you know, how you yeah. can dominate and how that can give obviously the team a lot more structure and confidence to go forward. Um, and look, we're delighted to obviously acquire him. You know, again, loads and loads of people, teams will be interested in signing that caliber of player. Frank's obviously touched on there in terms of the defence. Now, looking at the stats, we've got the best home defensive record, haven't we? We've only conceded nine, I think, at home. Yeah. Top of the pile, but away from home, second from bottom, conceded 30. So it's that gulf, isn't it, between them? It's trying to get that balance right. Um, would you suggest that the, the playing style differs a little bit more when we're away from home, or do we need to tighten up? Or where do you, looking at it from your point of view, where would you suggest it's going wrong? Oh, dear. Uh, <laughs> where's it going wrong? That is a question. <laughs> Um, if you knew that, you'd be in the dugout. Well, you? well, I don't know. I want to duck. I think if if we we've had a, a lot of those goals have gone in in a small number of games. I think it's really really important. Obviously, it's a huge frustration for anyone involved in the football side of the business when it, when you see one of your teams, you know, go three 0 down, yeah. and then not be able to stay in the game and go six 0 down. Like, that's disappointing. You know, you've only got to speak to our to our first team lads. They're extremely disappointed with it, with that. And they're, and they're in the analysis suite with the coaches, with the analysts, trying to dig out and try to find it, find the problems. Um, you know, timing of the goals in the game is always difficult, yeah. you know, like, you know, certain like the Wickham game, et cetera, in terms of when you go behind and then when they draw. Um, and we, we do feel that obviously we need to have, um, we need to be a little bit more resolute in those games, especially away from home. Um, like I said, it's an area that we need to work on. The guys are working incredibly hard to try to rectify that um, and hopefully moving into those last however many away games we've got we can certainly maintain and improve that home form because it yeah. has been very very strong um, and away from home pick up those points and be a little bit harder to beat 
Um, I think we've covered everyone. Oh, no, we haven't. There's still someone we haven't mentioned who, who has came into the club. How soon after Jermaine Defoe made himself a free agent were Sunderland seriously looking at the option of bringing in Jermaine Defoe? Well, we were, we were seriously uh, looking at the option of bringing in Jermaine last summer. Um, obviously, Rangers won the league, did really, really well. Obviously, at that point, there was a question mark. Generally, I think, what, what was he doing? Naturally, I think, remaining there in that position that, that, they, that they provided was natural off the back of you know, all the success that was happening up there. So that was, we, we inquired at that point. Um, obviously, you're tracking it through. Um, you know, we're having the conversations, it becomes apparent. He's going to be available. And then we you know, just embarked on the conversations to see if it was something that works for both sides. It's a, it's, a, it's a transfer that obviously draws a lot of attention in the local area and nationally because of obviously the connection that, that he has with the football club. Therefore, it, it draws a lot of scrutiny, a lot of um, podcast hours, you know, a lot of pages on you know, social media. So we get that. You know, I think with the, the whole process, it's really, really important that it works. For, it's got always worked for both sides. Um, and look, it's really, really it's nice, isn't it, when you get that romantic bit in, back into high-performance elite sport, you know, where those things can tend to happen from time to time. They don't come around very often. Yeah, and the, the club used the iconography of the Michael Jordan returning to the Bulls, that kind of thing. And I think that works really well because if someone were to achieve promotion this season, it is a kind of romantic fairy tale, isn't it? Yeah, just I mean, first of all, media team did an outstanding job with that video they posted on social media. You know, my... Uh, Goosebumps on you a little bit when you're watching that type of footage because everyone's really, really passionate about the club doing well and obviously Jermaine's connected to a period of time where the football club was doing extremely well. Um, I think like you've got to praise him for his ability to keep himself in the condition that he's kept himself in and, and, and at his age be a, a viable you know, player for the team. How dedicated is he? Oh, incredibly. I mean, like, you know, over the last month I spoke to him four or five times. Um, you know, there's the whole piece around, you know, player coaches and you know, he's here to play. Yeah. Like that's you know, let's not beat around the bush with that. So that's his main role coming in to score goals yeah, and solely focus role. on and then maybe doing a little bit of coaching yeah, just to get you know, get, in, get in the team and everything else. Now naturally when you're recruiting any individual, you're looking at what the benefits of bringing that person in. You know, we referenced Danny Bath and you know, you've only got to see Danny around the building to understand that he's offering more than just being on the grass and we knew that. Yeah. But then when I'm out on training field this morning watching training and I'm seeing a young under eighteen player you know, in a little passing session on the side with Jermaine Defoe, you know, players that take that extra interest in those young players completely aligned to our strategy. You know, players that understand around high performance, what attitudes you need to have to try to win and grind results out and get promoted. He has all that. So there's lots of other intangibles, if you like, that come with, with Jermaine. Yeah, and some of those other intangibles are ticket sales, ultimately. I heard the club shop temporarily ran out of some of the letters which they need to put on shirts as well this week. I mean, there's yeah, a buzz I mean, about the club again because of him. Yeah, I mean, that's obviously great. And I think, um, you know, the individuals hanging around outside the training ground on deadline day make it exciting. And, like, you know, I, I was having this conversation with Kill, you know, afterwards. I was that, you know, that's what you want. You want it to be enjoying. Enjoy, you want enjoyment out of it. The staff want enjoyment out of it. There was a buzz in the training ground when we knew it, it was sort of sorted a couple of days before. But then when you know it's coming to the training ground and everyone's sort of, like, really hyped about it. Um, that's what you want it to be, don't you? You know, I don't think we want to shy away from um, romance, you know, um, legacy, uh, impact. They're the things we should be promoting. With Jermaine coming in, obviously he was done. It was near enough on deadline day alongside Jay Matete. Obviously, Jermaine was out of contract. Those who's a free agent yeah. did, didn't have to sign. Did you try and tie it in along with Jay's at the same time, thinking it was going to be quieter outside with if people got word that uh, Jermaine was out and about around Sunderland in the area? Uh, so sort of trying to creep him in in the dark and get it done on the quiet, but obviously it got you out. Can't get, it? It got out. Well, first of all, I don't think anything gets done on the quiet in Sunderland yeah, yeah. because that's it. And that's like that's one of the nice things about it, isn't it? Because it is so important to the city and the community. So, I, you know, I think them things, you've just got to enjoy all those things rather than be negative. It was just timing, I think. I mean, the, the conversation rumbled on for a couple of weeks. I because it was an interest and then a lot yeah. of the fans were saying, what's happening? Why is it taking so long if he's coming? Was he weighing up yeah. his options as well? I suppose he has to, doesn't it? Well, I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure he would. I mean, like, you know, I didn't get into the level of conversation in terms of that's none of my business. But for him, it was, this was what we're trying to do. This is our story. This is where we want the club to go. This is where we think you can add value. Um, you know, do you want to do it? Do you still want to play? It's clear from day one, I want to play. 
And I mean, that motivation at that age to want to keep playing, you know, you're talking about these top, top people in yeah. world sport who can just keep out, keep wanting to have that competitiveness to get on the pitch and play. And then I think it was, look, it was just um, fate probably more than anything, you know, in terms of how the conversation picked up and then it was like, okay, we're getting it done. And then you don't, you don't then want to go, well, I tell you what, we'll leave it four days, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and then on transfer deadline day, obviously, you know, that in the end it was, look, we just need to, we need to get it out there because I think, you know, it provided a little bit of excitement on the day. Um, it was a natural fit and a natural way to probably end the window. Um, I don't think it would have been as inspiring if we'd left it to the next day and gone, oh, by the way, this has happened. Yeah. You know, people knew the cat was out the bag by then, wasn't it? I think there was someone running around the training room with a camera. So. <laughs> hey, I can confirm that there's no one with a red hat on outside of the window while we record this podcast. <laughs> um, OK, we've done all the players in. Um, a, a word on the players out then. There are a few players, maybe unexpected, you know, Tom Flanagan's with the last minute. You know, yeah. did they, These were moves probably for... You know, reasons where the players felt like they had a, a, more of a future, maybe. You know, they've got to think about their own careers, don't they? Yeah, well, you're, you're managing squad dynamics and you're managing individuals. You're managing people you're working with every day and you're trying to do your best for, for everything. Now, everything has to fit Sunderland. That's the number one thing it has to fit. It has to fit what we're doing. But if, it, if something fits what we're doing and then we can, we can be uh, flexible, if you like, and, and we can make the right decisions that help individuals, hopefully that's helping you long term in terms of how we deal with people, how we recruit people, how people feel when they're working at Sunderland. Um, we brought Danny in, naturally. You know, um, in the, that sees obviously Tom on the bench in the Bolton game, etc. Tom's got out of contract in the summer. He's done incredibly well for us over the season to date. But then you're in a situation where you've got someone's contracts running out, they're not in the team, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. they, and, they've done, and they've done well for you. So that's a difficult balance. The opportunity yeah. came up for Tom. You know, it's not where we've gone and sold the player. And he's got to think about yeah. his family, hasn't he? Yeah, 100%. And we're doing that as well. You know, we're having that conversation with him. And I think the ideal, ideal scenario is we, we would have brought another one in. Um, and we might have done that before or after. It yeah. wasn't necessarily tied to it. And look, I think that's just around managing the squad dynamic, you know, as well. Um, you know, these, these things happen. Sometimes they can pick up pace and happen quite quickly. You know, transfer windows, are, you're making those decisions. Like I said, we're accountable for those decisions. So people might say, well, you, you know, you haven't got this, you've not done that. We're light here, we're light there. I think you're always trading off all the time. Mm. We just feel that we're really comfortable where we're at at the minute. Is that like cat and mouse on, on deadline day, really, where you've perhaps said to Tom, you know, you, you might not going to get the game time now that you've had in recent weeks. Um, there's op options for you to go elsewhere. He's then talking with his agent to speak to the clubs and then there's a deal getting done. You think you've got another centre-half lined up to come in and replace I mean, him. Honest, that, those weeks. conversations are happening weeks before, before because, you know, you're being respectful to people to say, look, Give this the is the up. direction we're going. Speaking with his agent, this is where we're going. This is what we're going to try to do. Yeah. Because I think, again, it's just rude. If you know that information, someone turns up on any of the days in the window and, uh, by the way, oh, I didn't realise that was happening. Mm. So you're trying to keep that dialogue um, within common sense. And, and then the opportunity came up for Tom and we were already in the motions of trying to do other things. You know, like I said, we made a really, really significant bid on two players before, you know, in the last week of the window in that type of position because we felt it's long-term an area that we wanted to keep improving on. Um, and on deadline day, we had, you know, th three stroke four loan of players that really fit what we wanted to do, which unfortunately none of them materialised and you know we could have let Tom go the week before it just happens it's on the same day so I get it people go on about you should have kept him but you know those decisions were already taken and those conversations with those other players coming in were already occurring and any of those any of those players could have been a yes at any point in the last three days so unfortunately it's just the outcome and uh, we have to take responsibility for that yeah we're, we think we're comfortably and we're well placed yeah and, and you touched upon it Tom probably had one of his he's probably his best season uh, to, the, to the date really for Sunderland this season uh, another couple of people who've contributed this season Aidan O'Brien you know when he's appeared has contributed to the first team and Denver Hume has been at the club for many years as well yeah we well, got again I mean Denver's Denver's been here academy graduate we want to try to assist those players on getting the right exit routes so you know Ollie Younger Hawksy you know two players again to make sure that players that come into our academy programme know we're going to look after them, they're going to take care of them. And on the exit, I think that's sometimes the most important bit for people to really trust you with their, you know, with their son in, the, in your programme. Um, Briz, obviously, well documented, he nearly went on loan at the back end of the last window. That one fell through on deadline day. He was first class in his attitude and his application, in fairness to him. Naturally, felt he should be playing. I mean, you know, we'd be really worried if he didn't because, you know, what would yeah. you, your professional athlete, Again, with the signings we've made, Clark, 
um, Roberts, you know, the other players that we've got in the team, you know, where was his game time going to come? And therefore, it was a natural conclusion for him to, to find, you know, an alternative. Yeah, just I'm looking. I think no, just looking at Josh Hawks and and, and uh, Ollie Younger as well. I think they're that age now, aren't they? Where they've almost come to the end of the time in the 23s football. They've had a taste of it with the first team, a few Papa John's games here and there. They would have been frustrated, wouldn't they? Either sat on the bench and not getting regular first team action, as you say. Ollie going to Doncaster, getting game time now. We'll probably see him at the weekend. And obviously Josh Hawks going back to Trammy where I think he was doing well there and there, competing yeah. at the top end of the table, I think. Yeah. I mean, look, we've, we've covered ourselves, is probably the best way of putting it in terms of the exits of those players yeah. for the future. But you've got to try to strike a fine balance, haven't you, where, you know, we can't purport to be around player development, young players, and then stifle young players just because it doesn't necessarily benefit us there and then. It's like Josh, I suppose, as well, isn't it? Sorry, going back to, going back to Harrogate. Yeah, yeah. And again, that, that was all pre-planned. He came yeah. back because we, we were short, short with, that, with, our, with our group, um, with the you know, with the proposal that he was going to go back. And yep. again, if you're doing it early and you're well planned and your communication's really, really clear with the other club, the player, the agent, our internal staff, then it should work fairly seamlessly. And like you said, none of these decisions are ad hoc decisions that are being scrambled around. I do appreciate when you get lots of things happen on deadline day, the perception is that all got decided on one day. Yeah. It's you know, the build up. Um, it's the build up and like you said, the planning. How was the development then of the youth teams around the football club, the under 23s and below? And how a word as well on the, the ladies' team, if you don't mind? Yeah, so, well, the ladies' team continuing to progress with that project. Obviously, we just got off the ground in the summer. Obviously, the results have been difficult in that league. The, the team structures changed a little bit within the, win, within the window for them, where we lost a couple, promoted a couple of young players up into the group, which again, is as per our sort of strategy. Um, they had an obviously incredible game against my old team, Birmingham, um, at St Andrews in the Cup, narrowly missed out, which obviously shows the potential in the group. Naturally, at that level, with the squad that we've got, it's tough, but you know, I think that's a tough period we need to get through, um, and then we can obviously build from there, and obviously Alex is doing a great job with Mel to do that. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a very, very competitive league, and considering the manner we which got up and everything else we've covered previously on the podcast, you know, pleased with the progress everyone's making on and off the pitch, probably don't deserve some of the results that have occurred. Um, but these things happen, competitive arena. Okay, and how's the, the academy progressing then at the moment? Now, the academy's continued to progress. We're doing, uh, really, really pleased with the changes that Stuart's made with Lewis in terms of the coaching structure. It's been, you know, well documented. We've had quite a lot of vacancies in there. Um, so what the guys have done is they've come up with a real clear plan. They've interviewed external, in, internal got the right people in to do the right jobs. Um, really, really keen to get some internal promotion because I think like we've got some really, really high caliber staff. So we've tried to reevaluate where everyone's at and make sure that we've put the right people in the right places within that coaching structure. Obviously, further to that is obviously implementing this uh, play model that we're looking for. Been really pleasing to see the development of that at the under 18 level and at the under 23 level. Um, 23s have been doing really, really well with that piece of work over the recent games. And I'm sure any of the supporters who've been to watch those matches have seen that. Um, and I suppose that's probably where, at the minute, you've got Mike and Proc working with the first team um, and covering that on their interim basis. You've got a natural slide of them just doing what they normally do, with, with, you know, technically with a different team. Yeah. Obviously, Open age. you know, uh, the uh, stakes are a bit higher, naturally, um, you know, and everything to do with that. But they're really, really clear and competent have been able to understand what we're trying to get out of the team. And obviously they're in the building around the first team every day. So it's a natural thing where they've always got, already got affinity and relationships with the existing players. So we don't see that as an issue. And like you said, we're really uh, proud of the calibre of the people we've got in the business. Good. Okay, now I guess that brings us on to the weekend's fixture then. Are we likely, are the fans likely to see some of the, the new signings? Uh, Mr. Defoe will be at the top of that list. Well, like anyone that's come through the door here, you know, and anyone in the building, they all want to be in the squad. Um, we haven't brought Jermaine in or Jay or any of the other guys, you know, not to play. But it'll be a case of, you know, who's fit and ready, what's the team, what's the shape, what do we want the changes to be. But I think, you know, there'll be a high likelihood of seeing, of seeing Jermaine in that squad on Saturday. Yeah, I'd imagine. I think he's only played a few minutes this season, hasn't he? Four Rangers up there. But uh, as you say, he's a fit lad. He looks like he looks after himself. And I think just adrenaline alone will get him through whether he gets... 20 minutes, 10 minutes or whatever towards yeah, the end of the game. Look, we, look, he's a sensible guy and he understands his body. That's why he's where he is at 39. You know, that's the difference between me and him. I'm 42 and uh, <laughs> a, looks like there's 20 years between us. Um, but we've got to manage that. What we don't want it to become, obviously, is he plays Saturday and he's out for 
three months because that would just defeat the whole purpose. So the medical performance staff are working with him. Like I said, hopefully we can get him into the squad as quick as possible. You know, I think there's a, obviously a really, really nice buzz around him and the other guys and the team in general. And like I said at the minute, there's a little bit of a negativity, coach change, etc. But the best way that we can do that is to do our jobs properly and hopefully the fans can pile into SOL on Saturday and we can get 35 plus, maybe 40,000. Um, if that's anticipating seeing the team win or seeing maybe Jermaine in the, in the, in the squad, then brilliant. Let's see everyone down there. I think it's a good job for, for Procky and Dodsey taking over, looking at the squad. I was having a look this morning, just thinking of me, a lot, starting 11, um, especially in the forward areas, trying to keep these lads happy, good competition for places. Yeah, we want, we want some competition for places. Obviously, the 17 games that we've got left happen in a really short space of time as well. So you want to be able to move and keep, keep them fresh. Like, you know, I've been out on the training pitch this morning watching training. We've got an incredibly talented group of people on that, on that pitch, you know. Um, there's a real nice, there is a real nice feeling around the group um, and there's some real high quality play. Like I alluded to at the start, if we can improve the, the sort of level of play that we're looking for, we can dr remove some of that inconsistency and we can get the results. You know, our objective still remains to get in the top two and no one at this football club should be looking at anything other than that. Um, and like I said, we'll see where we get to when we get to the 1st of May. Um, but like I said, you know, we'll be relentless in our pursuit of that. Christian, thanks so much. Good luck with the recruitment of the first team coach. Thank you, guys. Appreciate Cheers, Christian. It. Thank you. So that was Sporting Director Christian Speakman speaking to us here for what I think it's the fourth time he's been on SAFC Unfiltered. But as he said at the beginning, he promised he would give us regular updates. And he did. And he gave us a lot of answers, I feel. Yeah, I thought, again, he was, uh, he was fairly open, wasn't he? Um, you know, we fired a few questions in, which, you know, had to be answered in a way, didn't they, with the manager, or sorry, the head coach leaving his, his position. And uh, the, the search goes on for a replacement. Uh, as, we, as we said before the, before the pod started, um, you know, signings coming and going as well over, over the last couple of weeks. So it's been busy behind the scenes. So, yeah, back to the football pitch now at the weekend, uh, a game against Doncaster Rovers to look forward to. And uh, hopefully we get back on track. Yeah, we've heard stories of fans buying tickets for other fans and you know charity campaigns taking place around this fixture as well. We're going to see a lot of those new faces. It's going to be quite the occasion on Saturday, isn't it? Well, it is, yeah. You know, the new signings coming in and, and obviously Jermaine coming back to the club as well. Um, we weren't sure whether it was going to happen. It, his name was linked early on in the, in the window opening with him leaving Rangers um, and it was dragging out, wasn't it? So we, it wasn't looking likely it was going to happen, but it did. He's in there now. The whole place has had a lift, I feel. And uh, yeah, I think, as you said there, it's going to be uh, a few more people into the into the stadium of light at the weekend. Good crowd in there. Let's hope they, they give him something to, to shout about. And one good thing about recording at the Academy of Light means we get to maybe put a few requests in for some more big names here on SAFC Unfiltered. We'll be back very soon with one of those big names. Uh, so please do subscribe to us here uh, on SAFC Unfiltered on all, all of your usual platforms where you find your podcasts. We'll see you next time.